Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Uh, go with me, if you will. Uh, we were over in, um, uh, we had left over in Acts chapter 20. And um, that's where Paul was. It was it, we read verses 1 through and we stopped. It says, after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto them the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And, uh, and when he had gone over there, these parts, and given much exhortation, he came into Greece. Came into Greece. Now, Greece, uh, you know, um, Corneth is over in Greece. Uh, so it's, it's there. And uh, I was going to point it out to you, and I will when we get there. But that's where we left Paul last. That, so this has been since uh, late last summer, early, early fall, uh, when we got into the book of Romans, and that took a long time. Uh, just there's too much. There's so much in Romans. It's one of the most critical uh, doctrinal books in in the Bible and the New Testament believers. So it took a while to cover Romans, and it's a long book. Uh, it, the um, well, it's probably the third longest New Testament beside the Book of Acts. But again, we're in chronological order, and so uh, we got into Greece, and there he abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, he was about to sell into Syria, and he purposed to return through Macedonia. Uh, we, we getting there, uh, Dick, are we? Okay, getting there. Hallelujah. I want to show you, because uh, Paul was, was, was um, in Greece and wanted to go straight back to Syria, but there was some stuff going on, and uh, they were laying away. You know what? It's amazing how, in, you know, we, we kind of get this idea, if you just preach the gospel, everybody's going to love you. They tried to kill Paul. They were constantly trying to kill Paul. Matter of fact, we got one place we'll get to later on in the book of Acts, that 40 men made a vow they would not eat again until they killed him. Now, and all he was doing was telling them who they were in Christ and what it means to be saved and, you know, and, and what a rejoicing, you know, good news, good news, good news. And they want to kill you. That same bunch is running around today. Yeah. They are. They're still, they're still out there today. And, uh, yeah, 34th, we can uh, highlight that bigger or make it bigger or something. Hallelujah. We are, this is th Paul's third and fourth missionary journey. And how, Bill, do we know how to do it? There we go. There we just leave it right there. Okay, Paul's in Corneth. Now, he wanted to uh, sail straight over into Syria, which is right here. But uh, he didn't. And so he, he ends up making some uh, a kind of a roundabout way because people are trying to kill him. Everybody say, kill him. All right. And so Paul was in Corneth. And um, he abode there three months. And that's when he wrote Romans and Galatians. We just finished Galatians last week. And he had given much exhortation. He came in. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. And, uh, he bought that three months, and when the Jews lay wait for him, he was about to sail into Syria, but he purposed to return through Macedonia. Again, Macedonia is the upper regions on this part of, of uh, here. You know, we have Corneth here, but this is the Macedonian region up here, where Thessalonica and Berea are, and Philippi are. And so Paul, he, he, in, instead of going straight over, he, go, he goes a secret route. Basically, he takes a different route to uh, uh, thwart them. And... Um, and they're accompanying him into Asia, a Sopater, Beer, and uh, Berea, and a Thessalonica, Artichokos, and Secundus, and Gaius, a Derby, and Timotheus, and of uh, Asia, Tychius, and Trophy. And then I know I didn't pronounce this right, but who cares? Uh, uh, these going before tarried for us at Troas, and uh, now they're waiting for they're waiting for him over at Troas. All right, and um, we, we it, and we sailed away from Philippi, so they left Philippi and sailed. Glory to God. And, um, and, and after the days of unleavened bread, he came to them in Troas. So those guys went ahead and got to Troas. Paul made his way up from Corneth, uh, up through here, through Berea, Thessalonica, over to Philippi, and sailed to Troas, and, uh, where they abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morning, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber, and where they were gathered together, there sat in the window a certain young man named Eutychus. Now, this guy's young and uh, apparently dumb, uh, being falling into a deep sleep. Hallelujah. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. He fell out the window, sat up in the window, got uh, sleepy, and fell out and got killed. And Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him and said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak. So the, 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 Paul's preaching, preaches so long that somebody falls out of the window and dies. Then they go out and it goes down and raises from the dead. Then you know they had a revival. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you start raising folks from the dead in church, and you know, uh, that's one thing. 
Amen. And so then he went on and preached all night long until the morning, and then he departed. Hallelujah. Praise God. And, uh, and then when they brought the young man alive, and, were not, and they were not a little comforted, that's King Jimmy for, they were excited. Okay? And he went down to the ship and sailed into Asos. Now, so they left from Troas, just went over to Asos. I'm not sure how far, they couldn't be very far, but, you know, that's right, right along there, the very next city. Hallelujah. They're intending to, and they're intending to take in Paul, for his, so he had appointed minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Asos, we took him in and came to um, Maitia Lini. Uh, that's one of them, them names I can't pronounce real good right there. So Paul walked for Troas over. They, they sailed around, and then they waited for him. Then he, they, they went on down to this place, Maptolini, or whatever they call it. And, um, and we sailed thence and came the next day over to uh, Chios. That's a little island here. So they went from here over to this little island. And um, the next day we tarried at Samos, which is the next island down. And um, there's a lot of places he was going in a hurry. All right, this is, this is like a day trip. Amen. And then Terry at Triglidium. Now, that's not on the map, so that must have been someplace near the same us. And they, they kind of waited. And the next day we came to Miletus, which is the, uh, back to the mainland. They went from the island over here to the mainland of Miletus. And um, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus. In other words, when he was sailing, he just went by Ephesus. He just kind of skipped Ephesus because he didn't have time to stop there. He, he decided, so he just decided just to kind of sail, sail right on around Ephesus and, and go to Miletus and so forth. And, um, and because he would not be spending time in Asia, he hastened, uh, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus, he sent Elf to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So he, he didn't stop in there, but he called them down. Now, you know, he had spent some time in Ephesus and didn't want to get caught up with Satan because, you know, listen, these people were pulling on him and, I mean, you know, just to make it the bands of, of what he had, not in a bad sense, but they were, you know, he knew if he got there, he'd probably get stuck there, and he was trying to get to Jerusalem for Pentecost, okay? And, um, and when they were coming down to, uh, to him, he said unto them, you know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of Jews. This guy lived a constant life of the Jews trying to kill him. And, you know, somebody says something ugly to us and we get upset. I mean, how do you like wake up every day thinking that, you know, the people, your, your own kinsmen were trying to kill you? Every day. All right. Hallelujah. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, teaching both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I kept nothing back. In other words, he didn't compromise his message to make it safe for him. Paul would not compromise his message. He would stay with, he stayed with his message even though it endangered him. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save or accept that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God, and now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching in the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Now, you, you think about this. This is a dad Hagen to them. This is their spiritual father in the Lord. He's, he's the one who brought them into the, he brought things to them in the kingdom, taught them the ways of the kingdom, brought them up on faith and the Holy Ghost and grace and the things of God. And now he's telling you, you won't see me ever again. That's got to be tough. You know, I, I, I remember when, when the dad went home to be with the Lord. That was, that was, a, you know, it was a tough time. You, you just wept. Not, not, that, not that you're not rejoicing he went to be with the Lord, but you're, you're sad that he's gone from the earth. And um, uh, same, same thing, you know, when people have that kind of effect in your life, that kind of role in your life, it's difficult to see them go home to be with the Lord, and you don't get the, you know, you're here, he hadn't even gone. They tell him, I'm not going to see you again. And um, they, you know, so... Mm -hmm. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now he gives them a charge. Take heed. Now listen to this. Understand what Paul's about to do here. He's seeing these elders and pastors of that Ephesus church and those people up in that region for the last time. And he's going to charge them with, with one last word he's going to give to them before he, he departs and he will not see them again. 
This is how Saul. So you got to kind of put this in the context. The things that he says here are vitally important to him to relate to these elders before he sees them no more. Where he, he no longer has another voice to speak to them. Take heed unto yourselves and to the flock over the, which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. For the, I know this, that after my departing, listen, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, what? Because grievous men are going to enter in. People in your own midst are going to rise up. They're going to try to pervert and, and disturb the church. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Wow. Now, he could have said, think of what he didn't say. Teach grace. Teach faith. Amen. Teach the flow of the Holy Ghost. Make sure everybody speaks in tongues. Now listen, all those things are important. That's not what he said. He said to the ministers, he said, you watch over the flock and protect them from those who are going to try to enter in. Because they're going to come in and they're going to be grievous wolves. There are going to be people in your own midst who are going to rise up and try to stir up people and take people away from you. And, and here's my warning. Yeah, I was with you three years. And for every day and night for three years, I warned you. Wow. Why? Because the enemy is always looking for an inroads in the people's lives. He's always looking to call people out. He's always trying to enter in and, and, and do things in people's hearts and people's lives that separate them out and, and, and get them out of where God has for them what God, and what God has for them and to get them into places where God didn't call them. And so he is, he's warning the church. He's warning these elders. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things. How that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said it's more blessed to give and to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. So Paul says, I was with you three years. I warned you night and day. I gave you the things. I never withheld anything from you. I poured my heart into you. I gave it all. Now, you're, you're not going to see me anymore. I'm not going to be able to come back and straighten stuff out. I'm not going to be here to fix it. You have to take the bull by the horns and you got to do the right things. And you got to watch out because there is the, the Satan's waiting for the opportunity to disrupt and destroy what I've built. And so he gives him a charge. And it's a strong charge. You know, we, we get this idea around the church today that if we, if we just walk in love, everybody, you know, if we, now listen, I believe in walking in love, but you know, the love walk is, is not this man be pan be put up with everything, you know, and just tell people what they want to hear. It's the telling the truth in love. But it's still the truth. They have to have the truth. They have to have the gospel. They have to be taught the word. They have to be told to grow up. We were watching the Super Bowl Sunday night, and one of the players did something, you know, and, and they got complaining about, you know, that he didn't get a call or whatever. And all of a sudden, um, I think I said something like, yeah, he's going to have to go see Dr. Phil after the game. And then Nathan all of a sudden just burst out, you're an idiot. Put on your big boy pants and go back out there and practice until you get it right. I mean, he just starts doing this whole Dr. Phil thing, and he sounds just like Dr. Phil, you know. Uh, sometimes you just think, you know, we wish Dr. Phil could come in and tell everybody they're an idiot. Well, Paul did. He called them dear idiots of Galatia. We have to be warned, and we have to be prepared that stuff is coming. And we have to be ready that when the enemy comes and he's looking to destroy and to distract and to tear apart, that we have to understand God's bigger than that and God's got a bigger purpose than that. Amen? And it's, it's nothing new. It's nothing new. They were doing it in Paul's day. The same devil that runs around and hurts and tears up churches is the same one running around today doing the same thing. Just a different era, but it's not, it's not a, it's the same devil called the idiot devil. All right? He's out there trying to cause turmoil and trouble and mess things up. It's the devil. And Paul told these, he called the elders and, and talked to them and, and said, my last charge, I, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, uh, 
Brother Sumrall, in night, in, 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 when, when uh, the Americans were told to leave England, now he had been in England and he had been spending time with, Les, with uh, Brother Wigglesworth. He had, he had gotten connected with Brother Wigglesworth and go over about every day and pray with him. And, you know, Brother, he'd come over, Brother Wigglesworth, they'd pray, he, they'd get up prayer, and Brother Wigglesworth would say, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> no fellowship, no, you know, no sit down eating crumpets and having, and having tea. You know, it was, I'll see you tomorrow. And, um, and the last, uh, and, and they found that the Americans were being told to leave. They, had to, they, were, they were ordered to leave England. And um, he went to see Brother Wigglesworth for the last time. And Brother Wigglesworth began to prophesy over him, knowing he would never see him again. He laid his hands on him, began to pray over him, then began to prophesy over him about the coming ways of revival that he would not see. That, you know, Brother Sumner would be a part of, of helping bring things in. You know, he, is, he laid foundations to bring things in. And that the boldness that was on him would come on, Wiggle, on, on Summerall. And Brother Summerall said this. He said the boldness that he had in his ministry did not come on him until Wigglesworth laid hands on him. That boldness came at that time. And to know that you're seeing him possibly at that time, didn't know for sure, but prob in all probability, for the last time, someone had mentored you and put into you and, um, and, and, and deposited into you. Um, I remember in 1995, Nathan was about two, three, 95, 96, we went out to um, uh, California. We, had, we, had got, we bought this little compact computer, and with it we got two free companion passes to fly. Well, at that time, kids under two or under a certain age flew for free if they sat in your lap. Now, that, that's not there anymore, but that was then. And so Janie and I bought a ticket, and we were going to go see her brother in, uh, in um, uh, Redlands, California, near Loma Linda. It's out there, um, in, you know, outside the city, about 60 miles, 40 miles, 40 to 60 miles. So we were going to go see Cal. And, uh, but we decided, you know, and, and at the same time we were planning this trip, we got a letter in the mail that said that, Ed Dufresne and Mark Brzee were doing a meeting at, Ed, I mean, uh, not Ed Dufresne, Lester Summerall. And Mark Brzee were doing a meeting at Ed Dufresne's church in Temecula. And we thought, man, we're going to take two weeks. We're going to fly out there. We're going to get a hotel down there and go to that meeting. And uh, we did. And so, you know, the whole thing is we ended up out there, you know, and with that week-long meeting with so brother, brother, brother Dufresne, Brother Summerall, and Mark Brzee. And it was, it was, a, it was, it was an amazing meeting. See, Brother Summerall went home the next year. Well, what he was doing, and he, he, I'm, I'm, I remember, you know, he was, he, was, he was trying to, he had all the ministers come up at the end of the week and lay hands on all of them. And what he was doing, and we, we you know, and we talked with uh, Brother Mark and, and, uh, about it, and he said, Brother Summer was, go, was going around, and he's trying to get to as many ministers as he could get to and lay hands on them and impart to them before he goes. He knew he was going. See, Sister Summer had already gone home, and, uh, and Brother Summer was, was ready to go. And, uh, but he, he, had, he had a mission before he left, and that was to lay hands on and impart things into ministers before he left. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, sitting down at dinner with him and Ed Dufresne and Mark and, and in the room of about 15 or 20 ministers after services was cool. But the impartations were, was, more, was what we were there for. Oh, yeah. I, I, I know something. You know, what went in you? I don't know. Some, some impartation. Well, how are you going to know what it? When God, it's time for God to draw it out? When it's time to be brought out at, at the right time for whatever that is? You know? I'll say, you're 56 years old. You ain't done much for Jesus. You know, Brother Hagin didn't start Raymond until 1950, until he, uh, he was 58 years old. Brother Hagin's ministry went from relatively small and unknown except in small circles unto an international ministry in the last uh, 29 years of his life exploded. I don't see these guys who think all the young guys have it all. I'm telling you, the, the guys who've walked with God are the ones that have something to give out in those last days. Amen. Brother Summerall, oh man, he was putting it out. He was giving it out. He was laying hands on people. Bring your brother, him and Brother Dufresne laying hands on, on us in that meeting. And I'm telling you, I know. Mark prophesied one time. He came to me. He was, he was here. He was in this building. And he started talking about deposits of the Holy Ghost. See, it's so important. It's so important that we recognize that when deposits are made, they're made for a future withdrawal. You make a deposit with the determination that in the future, there's going to be a withdrawal. The reason for the deposit is so you can withdraw. Now, you don't withdraw if you don't need it. Or if you don't, you don't withdraw it unless you, there, it's the right time for that withdrawal. Mark began to prophesy. 
about deposits in, in me as a minister that had been made over the years and that there, there was a resource there because of our Pentecostal roots and that connection in the word of faith teaching there was something different There's, I, don't, I know I can, tell you, can I tell you this I know for a fact we haven't drawn them out why not I can't draw out what's not time to draw out there's times I want to there's things I want to reach in there and get there's things I want to do but it's not, it's not the right I know it's, there's a time coming and I'll know it'll be the right time Again, it'll be, it, and let me say this, it'll be, it'll be ordered by God. What do you mean? You remember the Jews? When they came out of Egypt, they got their dowry. They were just loaded up with stuff. Y'all remember that? And there came the time to build the temple. See, Solomon wasn't, didn't get to build it. David did. Or, or, huh? Did I get it backwards? I got it back. David didn't get to build it, but Solomon did. But David and his men gave like $30 million for the building of the temple. They got to a place one time where they were, where they were going to restore the temple. And the people started bringing out of the deposits so much they finally had to say, stop. There's more than we have. We, we, and, but they didn't do it until there was a time that the Lord said, do it. Amen. And so, you know, I go back and I, I think about, you know, as a kid. Now, I don't know. I, I'm not sure why God drew me over here a little bit. We'll, we'll tie this back in because they wept on Paul. They, see, he made those deposits in their life. They weren't going to see him anymore. There's, there's a connection. There's something about spiritual connections that, that are hard to explain in, fa in fathering and son, spiritually speaking, relationships. They're, they're, they're just, there's something. Even if you don't have a personal, intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with them. They could, be your, they could be a spiritual father to you. You have, not many, you have many instructors, but not many fathers. That's what the scripture said. And, um, but I remember, it's, it's a small kid. We go to the altar, and these old saints there, they were, I mean, listen, they were, don't tell, I'm just trying to be funny. They were two days older than dirt back then when I was a kid. They had grown up in the old Pentecost from way back. They'd lay hands on you and, and pray over you. I remember some Brother Paramore speaking and going, God, use this young man. I mean, you're thinking, I ain't even saved. You know, I'm down here because I, I, we, we, got, we told we got to get down here first. The kids got to get in here first so the old guys can come lay hands on you. God's making preparation. And then, you know, we came out of that and, uh, you know, different things in my Pentecostal roots were ministers that were old Pentecostals lay hands on you. And then we came to Ramah, you know. And, uh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Different ones, you know, come. Can, can I tell you who was at Maine in my year? They, 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 they've, never, they've never had anything like this since then, I don't think. Kenneth Copeland, John Osteen, Lester Summerall, Fred Price, Dima Shakarian. <laughs> These are guys who came and ministered to us at Rain in my, my year. And there's uh, Jerry Savelle, Charles Capps. Did I leave anybody out? That that's pretty much covers the gamut. And Dad Hagen, of course. That, that was who came and ministered during that school year. You know? And then we went back for a, a alumni week um, a, a year or so later, and, and Janie was with me, and we were on the second row, and, and uh, kind of on a section that was at this angle. Gloria was right in front of us. Janie's checking out her toenails. Women. We're here in the meeting with Brother Copa Minister, and she's checking out what, what, how she did her toenails with her sandals. I'm like, honey, I don't care. <laughs> Brother, Brother Copeland began to prophesy about the glory. This is, 19, I think, 1982. Oh, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, he just said the glory, you know, talking about the coming glory on the earth. Oh, Sister Wilkerson ministered my year at Ramah, too. <laughs> A lot. Anyway. And he got to prophesying about the glory and talking about, you know, that the, there's a glory coming on. And let me tell you, folks, there's a bunch of stuff going on. But I'm telling you, the glory of God. Remember, the whole earth is full of his glory. The glory of God is going to be revealed. We are going to get more in the kingdom than the devil gets to take the hell. We win. I said, we win. And Brother Copeland walked right over. I mean, he's just prophesying. Listen, I, I don't think things happen by mistake. God orchestrates it. He walked right, looked me right in the eyes. And said, and you and I will see it together. And pop right upside the head. Glory. I said, the glory. 
Then we were ordained by Brother Hagin. Brother Hagin laid hands on us. Let's just, let's, some laid hands on us. I mean, there's just been so many people. Deposits, deposits, deposits. These things come from God in preparation for things. And this is what Paul was doing with his ministers. And let me say this. I know what God has for us to complete and finish as a church, as a ministry. There's a lot to do. And you may say, well, we got 30 people, five people over here. We don't have anything going on. You just hold a seat to your feet. Listen, just don't quit. Don't, don't, don't quit. I am telling you, don't quit. Don't get, don't get weary. Don't get weary. It's, it, there's, there's, there are things, there's a things are coming. I said, there's a things are coming. And, and, and we're going, one of the things we're going to do, we're moving. We are, we, we have to, we cannot stay uh, on this side. Three Raymond Pitt pastors are in Greensboro. We're within six miles of each other on the same road. That just don't work. You know, that's just not, it's not advantageous. You know, there are people on the west side, the, the little bit further, you know, southwest side, the north side. There's people all out there that don't have a Raymond church and they're not coming all the way over here. All right. They're, they're, they're going to a watered down church just because it's closer. So we're going, we're going to pray. And before, by August, when our lease runs out in here, we're going to know where we're going to be moving to. And uh, we're moving, we're moving somewhere else. Now, you say, you may have seen a little building on Facebook. That was a fishing expedition. If, if the money came in for it, we, we would buy it. But I'm telling you, you know, I'm not a type. That's, I'm not like going, we've got to have that building. We've got to have that building. I'm saying we're going to, we're going to go to a new place. We're just looking. So I went fishing. You know? Now, look, if somebody sent me $650,000, we'd buy it. We'd have bought it. We didn't. They, didn't. they might tomorrow. We'll buy it. You know? But I'm not uptight about it. We're, but I know this. We're going to move, and we're going to be able to affect other areas of town where people aren't coming over here who aren't willing to come over here, too far to drive over here for them. You know, they don't want to do it, and we're going to get them. We're going to go, we're going to go for toy. We're going to, listen, if you're out in a fishing tournament, you don't all go sit in the same little pot, part. You find another part of the lake to fish. Well, we don't have a permanent building. We have a great, I mean, I think if we had this set up somewhere else, it would be awesome. But because we're so close to people with permanent buildings, you know, they're kind of camped out, and people, you know, people, you know, people are people. We, and I don't begrudge that. Praise God. They got their buildings. They're doing what God called them to do. Hallelujah. But it's, it's not wise for us to keep fighting that, you know, when we could go somewhere else and, and get more done. You know, we're all sitting in the same part of the lake fishing. Well, we need to go somewhere else we can get where the fish are, are sitting out there, and nobody's fishing them. Amen? So we're, we're, God's going to show us where. Because we're not renewing. <laughs> we are not renewing. Okay, we're leaving here. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, on one side, it's like, but it's really comfortable in here. But, yeah, but it's, 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 it's not working, you know? I mean, you know how many times I go to one of these other churches and, they, and, and walk in for a meeting, and people come and go, Pastor Ed, we love you. We love your church. We love your ministry. We're supposed to be here. <laughs> Why did you even bother? Just, just say hi. <laughs> you, don't fill me in on, on, on you know, all the other stuff. Just hi, love you, you know? Uh, praise the Lord. Well, you know, we could have used you. We could have gotten some things done for us that God has for us to do. But, you know, whatever. Praise the Lord. You know, thank you, Jesus, and go on. But we're, we're, we're gonna, we know we have things to give. We have deposits, and we have giftings, and we have callings that have to minister to people. And we've got to get to where there's a place on the lake that nobody's fishing right now. That's what we're going to do as a church. So some of you are going to have to drive a little bit further than you've been driving. Some of you will drive uh, less because we may end up closer to you. Uh, but whatever, it's, it's what we got to do to do the work and to get the job done. Winston-Salem is not about undoing. This. I, and, and I just want to make sure that, that nobody gets startled by the Winston-Salem thing. We're not undoing what our, our calling is here. We just see it as an expansion of what God called us to do. There are people in Winston-Salem who would come to our church if we were closer. Well, the only way we can get closer is to do something like we're doing. That is create another campus that, uh, that's in a different time frame that they can come and get ministered to. That They want what we have, but they don't want to drive 40 miles. Well, I don't mind driving the drive. Okay? I don't mind driving over on Thursday nights and ministering in the Bible. I don't, I'm not going to mind driving on Sunday mornings and then getting in the car and driving over here. You guys are great. You'll have everything running, and it'll be, it'll, it'll, I'll just walk in and preach, and it'll be heavenly. All right? You just want to get to see me walk around before church on Sunday mornings. But I'll be around afterwards. I'll be right out there where I'm always at until we move to another place. And then I'll still be right out wherever that is in that building. Hallelujah. 
Because we, we have to reach the, the people that God's called us to reach. And, um, uh, you know, we, did, we, we, we are, are here. We got kind of stuck in some of these leases where we couldn't really get out. And every time we started looking, it was too late. And by then, we had to resign. There was nowhere to go. We, didn't, it was nothing, we couldn't do anything. And, but we, we've already decided in advance we're leaving. So we're going to be looking and preparing and getting ready ahead of time. Now, even if we have to go into a theater, like move into a theater and use a theater or whatever, go to Brassville, North, whatever, whatever we got to do, or school somewhere in town, we will do that until we find a place that we can st land on and stay. Okay? But we're not staying here. It costs too much. I don't like the guy, way the guy treated us this year, threatening to seize all our assets. <laughs> I don't like that. And I don't want to do business with people like that. And I don't want to be in a position where he has that kind of control over us. I want to be able to do what God has for us to do and not be stuck. And he's charging too much. He's just charging too much money. And we don't, we don't want to keep giving the money away that uh, keeps us from doing other things. There are things we could do for the kingdom that we're not able to do because of the money. And we're spending so much money on the lease. And I beat on them and beat on them and beat on them to lower it. They don't want to lower it. So anyway, there you go. So we're moving. Exactly where? Don't know you, but it, away. Yeah. We're getting off the, the six, three churches in six miles. This, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay? You know, somebody said, well, we're here first. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> they got permanent buildings, you know. Uh, the guy that, that sold one of the churches they're building, he came to me and talked to me. We weren't in a position to do what he wanted to do. He wanted to sell us his building, and it'd be his retirement package. We, didn't, we, we were in the middle of a five-year lease at the time. That was another two and a half years. That was, you know, another, we, we had to, we'd had to pay out $100,000 in lease to get out of the lease, and we didn't have that money, you know. He was trying to, he was going to give us his congregation and sell us the, the, the building in progress. It wasn't finished. And the, he was going to take the prophecy. He was going to go retire with it. Well, that was great, but we weren't there. So somebody else was. They got it. They're there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're moving on. Amen. But we're going to move on because we have deposits that God needs to draw out. And listen, things go some ways that you don't think they should go and don't, don't, don't have an explanation for other than it wasn't the right time. Can I say, you know, why didn't Jesus come earlier or come later? Because when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. There are things that happen in the fullness of time. Now, I, I talked to someone recently. They started the church. Somebody gave them a, a $100,000 to start their church. I'm thinking, bring it on, baby. Bring it on. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Bring it on. They started and shut it down three months later. And they told me, they said that we were the wrong time. It was the wrong time for us to start. I'm thinking, well, send me the money. We can do something with it, you know. Yeah, gave him a hundred thousand dollars, and I'm thinking, because my wife said, "Well, do we know anybody like that?" I'm thinking, I don't know. It sure would be nice. <coughs> Hallelujah! I wouldn't, I wouldn't blink at that. I wouldn't uh, get upset over that at all. A hundred thousand had it up three months to shut it down, so they got out in front of God, got out too quick, and won't, 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 won't working. Well, praise the Lord. You know, God, God could send somebody with $100,000 for us. All I know is we got things to give and things to deposit. Amen. And we're going to get them out. And these men who've been spiritual fathers in my life, who've empowered our ministry to do what we're called to do. Amen. So don't look on the outward. Look on what God has ahead. And uh, Shannon said something the other day. You know, we talked about the vision, the 87 vision, about the building with the four square building with the four revolving doors, people coming from every direction. And we've always, listen, we can interpret things and miss it. Did you know that? We can look at something that, we th that God shows us and we can interpret it and miss what God said. And, that, and, and when we kind of did this Winston camp and started talking about that, doing that, and that was, you know, just this happened so fast, I it's my head spinning. I, I mean, just, I'm like, she said, Daddy, have you ever thought that the four sides of the building were four points in the triad and not one building? East, north, south, east, and west. 
Faith and Victory Church of the Piedmont Triad reaching up in the north and, 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 and something, down in the south and something, in the west and Winston, in the east and Greensboro, and it being the four points and not a building. That the triad is the square building and that there are points where people are coming from every direction to different worship halls in the triad. And I thought, nope. And that has stirred me ever since she said it. And then I kind of I go back and look at the vision. And I go, you know, yep. <laughs> that sure does look more like it than one central bu building that everybody's trying to come to. Well, we're able to go and reach because you, you, you expand your reach. People aren't going to travel so far. You might get 2,000 people traveling to Kernersville. Maybe that's central triad or whatever. But you could be missing five. You understand what I'm saying? Or you might have, you know, you might have four places in the triad that have 500 people in each one, and you're not missing anybody that you should be missing. You're getting all of them. My whole vision of this is beginning to change and see differently. Amen? So nobody's going to get left behind. Greensboro campus, Winston campus, whatever else comes, you know, as God opens doors and opens our eyes to see things. But we know this, we're going to reach, and we're going to touch, and people are going to be changed. And they're going to, there's, there's anointings on our ministry that, that God's gifted us specially to do. Now, let, let me say something. My organizational administrative skills are not the greatest thing on the planet. Okay? I'm a preacher, and I love to preach, and uh, I hate that side, okay? And for the past three years, my, my wife used to take care of that. I, I know you probably look at it. We, were, we used to be a little bit more organized. Janie had to go to work, and Janie was the administrator, and I've been trying to administrate. I, I suck at it, okay? I, I do. I'm just, I mean, just, I'm being real honest with you right now. That is not my gift, you know, self-aware man. I am a self-aware man. That's not my gift, all right? She's trying to do it, but there's, you know, with work, I mean, it's just so, she comes home every night and spends hours having to take care of stuff because they demand so much. So they're supposed to, supposed to be working 30 hours a week and 40 hours a week. She's working sometimes 50 and 60, just trying to keep her, her job at the school going, and that's constantly, you know, every semester they come up, we may not have a job for y'all next semester. This, that, we're dealing with that every semester now because enrollment's down, da 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 so she's making sure she got all her T's are crossed and her I's are dotted, you know, not to give anybody a reason to get rid of somebody just because they didn't follow one little procedure or something. Janie is the administrator. She's the organizer. I'm, I, you, you know me. I, I, I can't even teach line on line. I mean, here I am. I, I'm, here. I'm, I'm way over here off of Paul being, you know, uh, seeing him for the last time. We're all over here. But that's how I minister. That's the way I've always ministered. That's the way I probably always will minister. That's just who, that's how God gifted me. Okay? So uh, if you see things go, man, this, this could be better organized. Yeah, it could be. You know? And God's helped me do it the best I can get, get it done until we can bring her back home. Okay? Because that's, that's her gift. Her gift is the administrative side. All right? And uh, I know it's, you know, we're... Um, we're believing God that things are going to grow here and in Winston, and we're going to be able to bring her home at least by the end of the year. That's, that's, my, that's my, where my faith is. By the end of the year, we'll be able to bring her home from having to work and come back to working full-time at the church and be able to do what she needs to do in the ministry. We need, I need her here. I need her beside me. I need, I need her. We need the finances, though, you know? Um, it's just where it is. And so she's doing, we're doing what we have to do to not, you know, get into a worse place. But I want her home. I, I need her help at home, okay? Uh, she is, you know, and my kids are still in school. And there's a lot of things going on. That, you know, I mean, Jesse's not, and Jesse's doing a lot of stuff. Um, but, you know, she's not as organized as, as me. <laughs> it's not her gift either. She's, she's the artsy side, so she gets excited about stuff and goes and does stuff. And, and I'm like, well, well, slow down, you know. <laughs> but too late, done, done. You know, she, she does that. Like, well, let's, let's, whatever. So, God's going to position us to do what we need to do. I don't know why I got over here. But it's still good. Amen? I do know this. There's deposits and gifts. Why didn't he give you administration? Because he doesn't. You go talk to him about it. You go argue with the Lord. Why didn't you make pastor and administrator? Because that's not how he called me. Okay? 
Yeah. Now, if you, go, if you go look at Raymond Bible Church, I'm going to tell you something. The administrator is Sister Hagen, Sister Lynette. She's the administrator. Don't record this. No, it ain't Pastor. He, he, I, the kids always come in and say, you're so much like Pastor Hagen, it's not even funny. It's like, you know, go in, say what you got to say, preach, say stuff that, you know, that the organizers are going, no! Because <laughs> uh, they're all going, no! <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, anyway, so praise the Lord. But we're, we're going to get the job done. Amen? And uh, we got a lot, we got a lot of years left to get a lot of stuff done for Jesus. There's a lot, there's a lot to get done for the kingdom. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities for us to minister. And we want, we want to get there and do those things. We want our church. Our church has always had the right heart about things. We have a heart about missions that, that most churches don't have. We really do. We've done things that, that big churches don't do. Because we, we have a heart for people. I mean, you know, we kind of threw this thing together for the, uh, the uh, women in the uh, Iranian uh, camp, refugee camps, or Iraqi camps. I forgot where they were. Or Afghan, wherever it was, the Beamers went. We got pounds of soaps and shampoos and stuff that we got from hotels. And that was packed up and shipped off from our church. And, and then the Beamers took pictures of it and put it on their webpage. And it was the cards that our kids made. Tell them they love them in uh, Arabic. That, that went all, you know, and uh, some Arabic person that the kids knew looked at it and said, how did you know how to do that? We, we've looked at it. We found out, see, found out how to do it. To put that extra touch to minister life to those women. Our church did that. We give hundreds of pounds of food to urban ministries every year. We, we send hundreds of shoeboxes or the equivalent of hundreds of shoeboxes to Guatemala to minister to those children in, in the Marion Zirkel's ministry. There are things that we do that big churches don't do. Because we love people and God's got a call on us. And I've ministered every season. And I'm telling you, there's nothing like going over there as a pastor and coming back and having a vision for the world. Expanding your vision to the world. There are things that we have to do. And those are giftings here to equip us to do them. Amen. I said Amen. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Well, I didn't turn out, no, it was going to turn out and be vision night. but We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.